welcome to Inside the Admissions Office, your one-stop shop for expert advice on the smart way to get in. My name is Ellen, and each episode I'll bring you an interview with a former admissions officer, a graduate of a top college, or an admissions expert. These interviews will take you inside the admissions office and will be full of behind-the-scenes knowledge, first-hand experiences, and application tips that will help you get into your dream school. If you'd like to chat with one of these experts, you can sign up for a free consultation at the link in the description of this episode. Today, we'll hear from Natalia Ostrowski, a former assistant director of admissions at the University of Chicago and an ingenious prep counselor, about what you Chicago admissions officers really want to see from their applicants. Hi, Natalia. How are you today? Great. How are you? Good. Thank you. So just first of all, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself, about your background, perhaps your educational background? I'm originally from Chicago, and I went to the University of Chicago as an undergrad where I studied history. After college, I worked a little bit in publishing and then found myself back in uh, the University of Chicago as an admissions officer. My main region there was India, as well as the Middle East, South, the rest of South and Central Asia, Southeast Asia as well, not including China, um, but read for the entire world as a second reader as well. So a big part of my admissions experience there, I was at eChicago for several years. After that, I worked in public relations and then started working with Ingenious. So this will be my seventh admissions cycle. I want to make sure that our listeners have a really strong understanding and kind of foundation about the how admissions works at eChicago. So I'm going to kind of start with some preliminary questions, assuming that you know, they're coming with a very basic level of understanding. So first of all, what are the components of a UChicago application? The University of Chicago application is on the Common App. It didn't used to be. When I applied, it was still a paper application and we were still on the uncommon application. But since 2009, I believe we've been on the Common App. So all those components are the same. You have your background info. Where did you go to high school? letters of recommendation, activities list, personal statement, et cetera. And then the University of Chicago piece of the application has two main essays. So they have the why you Chicago and the longer essay question, which is different every year. There's also a optional interview that you can record and send. I think two minutes long. They used to have interviews with admissions officers or college students who are working in the admissions office, but they no longer have those. So now it's just down to the optional, down to the optional recorded introduction about yourself. And would you suggest that students take advantage of that? Are there any cases where it wouldn't be advantageous to record that video interview? Full transparency, I was not at the admissions office when they switched to this model. This is a recent development in the past couple of years. From what I understand, if you're comfortable in front of a camera, do it. If you're not, don't do it. (laughs) Um, Really play to your strengths here. Also, don't just repeat what you included in your Why You Chicago or what's in your activities list. Um, Really make it an enjoyable experience so that the admissions officer is learning something new about you. Yeah, and my, my biggest feedback is probably not to repeat too much that's in your application. And then they don't care about the quality of the, you know, what the video looks like. So don't doubt a Hollywood director to <laughs> help you record this video. It can really be your iPhone or phone, smartphone. Just record yourself talking for, for 90, 90 seconds to two minutes. Don't think about it too hard. If you're comfortable in front of a camera, great. If not, don't worry about it. I think the kids these days also have ring lights. So I imagine that <laughs> they already have some pretty good equipment to set up. And that brings me to my next question is when we're talking about the people who are applying to UChicago, what kind of students is UChicago looking for? There's three main things that the University of Chicago looks for, and this is true probably of any highly selective college. Number one, can you do the work? So they're going to be looking at your transcripts as well as any standardized testing that you are able to send over and 
I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about standardized testing in general later in the program. So they'll be looking to see, you know, are you able to do the work at this high level? And they can tell that through an upward trajectory in grades. Hopefully you have a pretty high level of A's or A equivalents throughout your high school career while also taking challenging courses. So they'll definitely be looking into that. If you're interested in a STEM subject or a social science like econ, they'll be looking for really strong math grades. So the more you can you know, showcase those strengths, the better. But they'll also be looking for your ability to think critically and take advantage of the other courses that you'll be required to take at the University of Chicago. So that's the first one. The second one is really looking into what kind of student you're going to be on campus. How active will you be? How will you take advantage of the resources? What will you add to the resources? And this can be really gleaned from your activities list, looking for leadership, looking for community service, looking for community building, things like that. And the last thing is fit. So this is a huge one. If you're a great fit for you, Chicago, you've done your research, you understand the core curriculum, you love the core curriculum, you don't want to, you know, use your AP credits to try and get out of core curriculum because that's not going to work anyway. That's a really huge one. And the glue that I think really brings all you Chicago students together, regardless of background, academic interest, et cetera, is just a love of learning for learning's sake. They are nerds in, in the truest possible sense forever <laughs> in perpetuity. So that's that's probably the the kind of student that you Chicago is looking for the most. So that actually leads super well into my next question, which was just what makes you Chicago unique? It sounds like the core curriculum is a really big part of the experience. So the core curriculum is a required piece of U Chicago's curriculum. It's not the only school with a core, but the way they approach the core is pretty flexible. So there are seven different areas of study. So you have the humanities, the social sciences, civilization, art, music, or drama, biological sciences, physical sciences, mathematics and foreign language. So I guess technically that's eight. <laughs> um, so within the humanities, let's say you can take a course, a series of courses called Readings in World Literature, or you could take Human Being and Citizen, or even do something a little bit different, the series called Media Aesthetics, where you're looking at image text and sound. So you might be reading the same text, but you'll be looking at them in a, from a different perspective. And this is true across all of the subject areas. And another thing that is really unique, I think, to Chicago is the fact that you can do your civilization sequence abroad with your professors. That's another thing that's fairly unique to Chicago is that in study abroad for almost all programs, the professors will travel with you rather than taking study abroad at a university in Spain and you're being taught by that university's professors. Your professors from Chicago are actually traveling with you during that study abroad experience. And let's say if you are doing the history of European Civ in Paris, you can also take language classes. There's also study abroad that focused on math students or that's focused for athletes so that they're able to go in their off season. So it's really, really nice little thing there that I think most students don't know about in their, in their search process, but the ability to take a core requirement abroad is, is one that a lot of students really enjoy during their first two years. And it is something you want to complete in your first two years because it really is something that helps you narrow down or focus more on your major that you end up applying for either in sophomore or declaring rather in, in sophomore or junior year. Oh, it sounds like UChicago really values, you know, a global perspective and giving the students those study abroad opportunities. I think that's great. Studying totally. abroad was my favorite experience of college. And I, I think most people think that as well. I know some of our admissions officers say in general not to apply as undecided, but it sounds like for you, Chicago, that that's okay because of the core curriculum or no, uh, people still need an idea. No, I would still say that 
if you're undecided once you get to campus, sure. But when you're putting together the application, at this point, it's too competitive to apply undecided, I would say, to any college or university. The admissions officers really want to understand where you'll fit in in academically. So hopefully you have some idea. If you are undecided, tell us what you are thinking about doing. Maybe you're interested in astrophysics, but you're also interested in creative writing. Talk about both and what areas you're going to be really taking advantage of on campus. Be you really love documentary filmmaking, but you want to be an econ major. Well, UChicago has amazing resources for both. So make sure you research those and talk about them, because if you can't be specific about the reasons why you want to come to the University of Chicago, there's no point in applying. Did you learn anything as an admissions officer about the university that you had not known as a student? Was there anything about your perspective that changed? (laughs) I was a history major. I initially came into the college as an English major. I was, you know, one of those kind of undecided where I knew I wanted to be in the humanities or social sciences, but wasn't exactly sure where, but I didn't really focus much of my time in the sciences. So that's definitely an area that I learned more about when working at UChicago. I also, you know, wasn't a part of the admissions office really in any way as a student. And it was really great meeting the students who were involved. They're so excited about the school, you know, talking to and working with the tour guides and and learning about their stories and seeing the different perspectives that they have, especially since, you know, I graduated a long time ago and seeing how the university has developed over time been really, really wonderful. I think one thing that I imagine a lot of applicants find confusing is just the different admissions options. So early action, early decision one, early decision two, regular decision. I think people have probably a good understanding of what each of these entails, but is there a strategy behind it, you know, for what students should choose? Definitely recommend that you apply early if you can. At this point, the regular decision admit rate is extremely low. We're talking single digits, probably like two or three percent. It's very low. I think the majority of students are admitted in the three early rounds. If you're 100% sure that UChicago is your choice and you love it and you can't live without it, ED1. If you're not 100% sure but you still want an option, or if financial aid is an issue, you can do early action. Typically, every school cares about yield. Yield is the student applies, gets in, are they going to come? So the switch to early decision is offering students the ability to say, I will definitely come if I am admitted, because you basically have to if you sign an ED agreement. They left early action You know, I I wasn't in those meetings. It happened after I left admissions. But early action, you know, has been a part of the university's history. So I think a lot of alumni would be really upset (laughs) if they got rid of it. But it's, it's a great option if you can't commit in terms of financial aid or if you're applying somewhere else early decision and you want to have an option with the University of Chicago. I would only do that, though, if you're able to put together a really great application. The worst thing that could happen is that you rush to get an application in for early action. It's a mediocre application. You didn't really put too much energy into it. And then you get either denied or deferred to regular decision. Now, on the other hand, maybe you are ready to apply early action and you're really excited about the school, you just can't commit to it, early decision, you can submit it early and you've you've given it the time and energy that it needs, that'd be a great application. You still might be deferred, but if you are deferred from early action, you can decide if you want to do ED2 or regular decision. And at that point, you need to decide if you're willing to commit to an early decision agreement again. And if you are, I would highly suggest doing ED2 because at that point, they are going to admit students who they know will come over students, you know, they're not sure yet. So 
that would be my advice in terms of strategy, really for any early strategy, your application, first of all, has to be good enough to submit. And if it is ready, go ahead. But again, if, if you really want to go to Chicago and there's no other school you could think of, do the ED. How does UChicago view test optional policies? So UChicago was actually test optional before COVID. I'm not sure if it was a year or two before. And it was a huge initiative that they put together. It's like very, very awesome thing they did, I think, in order to be more accessible to students who aren't able to have test prep, who students come from areas, either remote areas or just areas that don't support test prep in their schools. So it's, it's a huge step in the right direction. I think COVID has propelled this from other schools, you know, decades. So that's, that's all a really nice thing that's happened. So very pro test optional. Before COVID, however, the way that this was viewed is that you go to an affluent school in New York City, then you submit test optional while the rest of you know, your school group, your school group is the other students from your school applying at the same time as you to any particular college, and they all have testing, it's not going to be good for you. So it really, they were expecting 80% of students to still submit testing. They were still expecting international students to submit testing. Um, and this is all pre-COVID attitude. The, the point of test optional was for the underserved students who aren't able to access test prep or even access the test itself. With COVID now, you know, obviously that had to be extended to everyone just because test centers were closed. People weren't even able to take the test. This year, test centers have been opening up. If you've been able to take the test, great. If you haven't, then, you know, test optional is still there for you. But again, think about where you're applying from. Think about your peers, if they're submitting testing, because that's the first layer of students you'll be compared against. So another thing in general with test optional is that if you don't submit any testing, your grades will be scrutinized even more. So just remember that as you're considering whether or not to submit your test scores. Chicago also has a really strong business school. So how would you suggest that business students and economic students make themselves stand out? So the first thing that students need to understand is that there is no business degree at UChicago. There's only an economics degree. Students are able to take classes at Booth through the UChicago Careers and Business Program. You do have to apply to that. It is selective, but it is, there's a series of these programs. So there's one in in the health professions, one in journalism, one in the arts, et cetera. So it, it is kind of career focused in that sense, but you could think of it as almost like a minor or just like a, a career club that you are a part of. So as you're applying to UChicago, do not mention Booth because you're not applying to Booth. Booth is a graduate school of business. Maybe you can take classes there, but your first and foremost understanding of the college needs to be, why are you excited about the core? What else about the university are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do on campus? What are the, the clubs that you're excited by? Maybe you want to study molecular engineering. If you want to do that, Chicago's the place to do it, right? And th- those are the first things that you want to do. If you want to be an economics major, yes, Chicago is a great place to go for that. But not if you could care less about taking English or history courses. So that's, that's the one thing that I saw that was the most common when I read applications was students who either didn't even know that there wasn't a business major at UChicago, or if they did know that it was just economics, it was clear that they really didn't have an interest in other areas of the university besides economics. And we would call those students economonsters because <laughs> that's, that's all they wanted to do, really didn't look into other areas of, of the school where, where they could thrive. And one of the things, you know, you mentioned earlier that I thought was was really great is mentioned that it seemed like 
UChicago really has a global perspective. And they, they do not only in the sense of study abroad, but when they are seeing students go through the core curriculum, one of the things that you're doing is hearing perspectives from students with other academic interests than you. So if you're, you know, learning about, you know, John Maynard Keynes and you're reading the, the original texts that, that he wrote, you're going to hear not only perspectives from an econ major, but also from a physics major or uh, an art history major and understanding what are the things that, you know, what are the concepts that have been explained or that have been put out there and the differences between all the other <laughs> You know, big thinkers from from different perspectives, and so the hope is that sure, if you end up as an investment banker, you you can think about what you're doing in, in from many different perspectives, and that's the real hope with with the core is that not only are you able to bring your own perspective to a variety of subject areas, but you're going to be able to see and hear and understand perspectives from others that you can then take into your own academic journey. This is really making me wish I was a student. This is like a good commercial for you, Chicago. They did waitlist me. No hard feelings. No hard feelings. Okay. I feel like we have a really great foundational knowledge so we can kind of transition more specifically into admissions. So first of all, could you just walk me through a a day in the life of an admissions officer, perhaps in each season? Because there's obviously the on season of reading applications versus the off season of maybe recruiting. So we can start with the summer. So the summertime, you know, we at this point, probably by August is the wait list is about if it hasn't closed already, the wait list will close soon. They finalized the incoming class for the fall offering, you know, in, in a case where the class was over enrolled, you know, they wouldn't be taking anyone off the wait list. In the case that they're under enrolled, they might be taking a few students. It changes from year to year. So if one of your students is someone that you're able to take off the wait list, it's very exciting. And it's kind of the last point in time when that would be happening. Um, and all throughout the summer, you know, obviously in, in a non-COVID year, we'd be traveling, going to schools. We're also doing other programs on campus. There's a ton of tours that are going on. We have big uh, open houses on the weekends. There's a big open house in Rockefeller Chapel on campus. It's a beautiful non-denominational church on campus. And they actually play every day. There's an, there's a bell, bells, and they do songs like Star Wars themes or Harry Potter. It's actually really fun if you're on campus at that time. But yeah, so there's a ton of events going on. Students are, are coming every day. And we're doing a lot of information sessions. We're traveling to various schools, potentially libraries things like that. In the fall, there's going to be a little bit of more of this traveling because you can actually go to the schools and meet with the students, right? Instead of going to a library or a hotel or something or doing more things on campus. So you can you can do a little bit more traveling in the fall. Obviously, applications come in on November 1st. So that's when things really start to get busy in terms of reading. And that's really what we do from November through probably March. The November is the first big push. You have early action and now early decision. So those results come out in uh, mid to late December. And really for the first, all of November, you're just reading and making decisions in those weeks, right? In early December, we're going through committee, we're fighting for the students we want to admit. And then in the remaining time, the dean is is shaping the class in terms of early admissions. Then results come out. We keep reading (laughs) um, as the ED2 and RD applications are coming in. The ED2 Uh, results come out in February. So again, I was not part of this schedule, so I can't speak to it directly, but those results do come out sometime in February. So the students who do ED2 get to find out a little bit earlier, and then the rest of the results come out in mid-March, mid to late March. So Really just a lot of reading, a lot of decision-making, a lot of bribing with baked goods. But of course, that only adds to our winter weight rather than any real admissions decisions. And then traveling starts again in the spring. 
I used to travel for a couple of weeks to India in April and September. Those were the, my two big travel months. And um, we could be traveling for up to six weeks per year. Did the international team have any um, sort of specific considerations that the domestic team didn't? Yeah, so testing is a big consideration for international students, absolutely. Interviews, I think, used to be also something that we really liked to see from international students. In terms of training, I think a big one is just understanding the different school systems that exist abroad that don't exist in the U.S. To me, for example, transcripts from Florida are really foreign. Um, but as maybe the Florida reader would say like, wow, you're reading like these uh, transcripts that have A-levels or IB and, and you know, IB has become a lot more popular in the US as well. But you know, it's just a little bit more training based on the different transcripts. You'll see the different school systems that exist like A-levels, IGCSEs, IB, diplomas, things like that. But we do get, you know, familiar with the school profiles and, and talk to the college counselors at the high schools as you would if you're reading for, you know, a remote school in South Dakota or something. I think it's, it's a pretty similar process. Could you walk me through the admissions process? Specifically, say we have an individual's application, say we have John's application, they hand you John ap John's application. What does that process look like for you? Do you do, you know, a quick read through and then kind of have like a sheet that you fill out? What is the process between you getting the application and then going to committee? They read applications online. It's through a software program that's specifically created for reading applications. So the way that it looks, it's like you see each page in order as it is uploaded from the Common App, and then you can just flip through it. On the side of the software, you have like the space for notes for each of the areas of each rubric that, that you need to answer. So you can choose to which thing you're grading the student in and take any any relevant notes. So the way I read, people read applications in different ways. Some people start with the supplements, some people start with the personal statement. Personally, I just went in order the application itself. So that would be first the demographic information, right? Where did you go to school? Um, where are you from? What is your citizenship? Uh, and then you move on to the activities list. Well, before then you might have which classes you're taking and testing. Then you have the activities list and the personal statement, then the U Chicago essays at the very end. Uh, and before that, you also get the letters of recommendation. So really it's the, just the common app first in the order it's presented. And then the U Chicago essays, things I would take notes on are, you know, especially if it's an international student, what is their citizenship? For international students, we would also know if they are interested in financial aid or not, because that makes a big difference in how we read. The next piece is going to be testing transcript, right? Like what are your grades looking like? I'm reading the, if I don't know the school, I'm reading the school profile to understand the context from which the student is applying. And if I take a step back, I get a list of students from each school and I can sort by school and I would prefer to read by school group so that I can see the letters of recommendation compared student to student in particular. That is a huge help, especially if it's the same teacher writing, you can typically see a big difference. And, you know, you'll all, <laughs> a lot of times you'll see this is the best student I've had in 30 years. And then the applications are like, this is a great student. And so you can really tell um, how the teacher is feeling about the students and which ones they're recommending the most. So take notes on, on that. If there are any AP exams, what are those? How do they compare to the grades that the student is getting in the school? Then once I get to the personal statement, really, it's just a one minute, 90 second read of the personal statement. What is the point of it? I write it down. You know, what is the memorable piece of it? What is the lesson that I'm, I'm learning about you as a person? And then activities list. So really kind of looking at leadership, looking at community involvement, looking at how did you take your knowledge or expertise and make an impact? So I'm making notes on that. If I see a lot of activities that start in junior year, I would write JJ or junior joiner. <laughs> That's not great to have all of your activities starting in junior year. You want to have a lot of consistency starting in ninth grade. If you are an international student and ninth grade is 
considered middle school. We understand that and are looking at everything since 10th grade. But even if middle school for you is ninth grade, you still need to submit their ninth grade transcripts. So just a little note there for my international students. And then, you know, the big one is the UChicago essay, right? That's the last piece because everything before then can really be, are you able to do a good job at a highly selective institution? UChicago is one of many really amazing, highly selective institutions. So at this point, you know, I could say, great, you can do the work, you would be active on campus. But that third piece, for me anyways, was often the make or break. So do you understand the University of Chicago beyond website knowledge? Have you gone to an info session? Have you looked into the major that you're excited about? Have you looked into other, you know, thing? Maybe you love to watch movies. So you better know about Doc Films, the oldest student-run movie theater in the country, right? If you love comedy, there's a lot of really cool resources on campus. If you love dinosaurs, really cool resources for you on campus, but you have to know what they are. Um, and you have to be able to articulate why you want to study those specifically at the University of Chicago. Other tips about the why you Chicago essay. Don't talk about how much you love Chicago. There's a lot of schools in Chicago. So unless you have a really specific connection to the University of Chicago and why being in the city of Chicago and not mentioning Hyde Park Know, know your geography and where you will be. Do a Google Maps <laughs> check out that looks like. You're actually a 20-minute bus ride from downtown. So be sure to, to have something real there if you are talking about location for any college, actually. And, and, you know, talk about the core. Why is the core important to your education? Why do you want a place like UChicago? Sometimes I'll hear students who want to apply both to Brown and UChicago, and I am left very confused <laughs> because it's a completely different philosophy. And then, of course, the UChicago essay, the long one, the quote unquote weird one that in the admissions office, we never say that, but it's a really fun one. It's a way for us to see how the student thinks right? It doesn't matter how you answer. It matters, you know, what is your thought process in answering the question? This directly corresponds to how we will understand what you'll be like in the classroom, what you'll be like when you're having a discussion at three in the morning, you know, in the common room of your dorm. What is your thought process like? How do you think? Why is this important to you? And, and you know, try and have fun with it. Okay, a <laughs> long way to explain your first read. Um, there is a second read where someone else in the team, so maybe I would switch applications with Europe or Latin America or China person, um, and they would read my applications. And really, I'm not focusing as much on the school context because I am not the expert on, on Europe, right? I'm looking more, okay, can I see this student at the University of Chicago? Are they showing me reasons that they really know why they're a good fit to be here? They used to be, I think, probably when I was applying a long time ago, when the admit rate was a lot higher, you could show potential of being an excellent UChicago student. But these days, you really have to already be there. You have to show how you are practically are already ready to just jump in on campus. That's how the, the second read process works. And then we kind of give any notes, you know, like sometimes the second read could help push the student one way or the other, because you're also comparing students on a worldwide basis at that point, right? Like, or even domestically, if, if you happen to read for Wisconsin and someone else reads for California, you can, you can switch and, and kind of learn where people are applying from, what are the different qualities they're showing and, and say, wow, I really loved this story. And maybe, you know, if you're reading a very similar story constantly from your region, maybe it's not as unique to you, but it might be unique to someone else who doesn't necessarily read stories from that region. And then committee is, is a separate process. It lasts several days, if not a couple of weeks. We all meet together, prepare our notes. So biggest takeaway there is to make it easy for your admissions officer to advocate for you. 
So that's both in terms of grades, you know, that's and testing, that's what gets your foot in the door, but then also really taking it home with the fit piece, you know, showing rather than telling why you're a good fit for the institution you're applying to. It's a very long process um, where we all kind of go through and, and then vote. So you have to be very convincing in your teams. Sometimes the student will get the admit vote in committee and then be taken out to deferral or wait list um, afterwards, depending on the needs of, of the class as a whole, right? Because in committee, we're only looking at a small portion of the class. And while we might want to take 20 kids from a certain region, well, actually we can't because we need to balance out this other region or whatever. And that process, the admissions officers are not as involved in the balancing process. That's really up to the dean, the University of Chicago anyway. So you could find out that you had a student you really wanted who ended up being deferred in committee, but then they get admitted later or vice versa. So there's a lot of, you have to like check your emotions <laughs> because sometimes you have really have some favorites, but you know, we're trained to, to check our biases at the door when we're reading applications. We don't have to, you know, think that we would be friends in college, but we do have to understand that you would be a great addition to the classroom and beyond. And does the committee vote a majority rules? I wouldn't call it that. I would just say like, we would just have a discussion about the student. Really, it's the admissions officer comes prepared saying they want to admit, deny, or defer or waitlist the student, depending on when it is, and basically have to argue your case. And so if you argue your case well enough, then it's harder to argue your case probably to admit a student. If it's a high profile student that you don't want to take, you also have to make your case. So at that point, it's, it's more like a, an active discussion rather a majority rules for what makes sense for the region. And are those rubrics you talked about earlier publicly available? I imagine they're not. No. Yeah, I no, imagine they're not. not. I just <laughs> always found out in college using like the rubric as a basis always helped me write things better? Well, at, at this point, the what you need to know is can you do the work? Are you going to be active on campus? And are you a good fit? Those are the overarching things that any school is going to be looking for. And the rubric doesn't matter for the purposes of the student. The rubric only matters for the purposes of the admissions officer. You're not going to gain anything by knowing the school's rubric per se. If you know, you're a younger student listening to this, you want to be able to show commitment, show genuine interest, take your activities to that next level of impact. You're not going to play the game, so to speak. Like I, I really, <laughs> I know we're working in independent counseling. There isn't any way to play the game in a way that people think. Um, it really is a matter of one year you could apply and get in. And if it was any other year, you might not have gotten it. It really depends on the needs of the school that year. Maybe you play trombone and the year that you're applying, all the trombones graduated. So yes, we need all the trombones, right? But maybe you're applying in a year where they just admit, admitted all the trombones as freshmen and they're not going to need trombones for a while. Actually, they need a couple of flute players. Well, you're out of luck because when you are six years old, you chose the trombone and not the flute. So how can you prepare for that? You can. So, you know, it is a part of it. There's a lot that's not in your control. Um, a lot of it comes down to who else is applying alongside with you. Um, you know, how you decide your application strategy. If you're reaching too high, then, you know, you might be wasting your shot altogether. Uh, maybe you Chicago is not a good option for you. You're not in the range of their testing, or if you're not like someone who just loves to learn for, for learning sake, you just prefer to learn for the test or whatever. So it, it's really important to think critically about this and look less at the ranking of a school. Because even when I was applying, I think the admit rate was like 38%. You know, now it's like, five or six or something crazy like that. And it's the same place. Sure, there's a few new buildings up on campus. Their marketing is perhaps a little bit better, but it's the same school. It's the same core curriculum. The rankings fluctuate every now and then. I get a lot of these questions. Well, if I don't apply as an econ major, if I don't apply as this, like, 
oh, they'll definitely take, well, admissions officers read a lot of applications and they know when a student is doing that most of the time. <laughs> Don't insult the intelligence of these people. They're well-trained. They read a ton of applications, so they see right through any of that kind of thing. Just remember, three questions. Can you do the work? How will you be active on campus? And are you a good fit for the school? I think that students are probably pretty overwhelmed, especially now that they have to apply to so many schools of just the basic research of finding out school fit and how you can demonstrate that through essays. Do you have any suggestions or exercises that you give to your students for them to be able to build that knowledge of the school and its resources and kind of develop their own strategy for school fit and how they'll fit in without having just like read through pages and pages? Well, so you do kind of have to do a little bit of that, um, right? You have to take a look at the website. Like Each school is marketing to you through their website. So how are they doing that? look on the front page. What do they talk about? Those are the things that they're, they're saying, like, this is how we're presenting ourselves. This is what we want from our students to understand, right? So that's one piece of it, just to get the general vibe of the school. And, you know, I don't want to go into the details of just typical website research, because I think there's a ton of those resources probably on our blog already. But one of the things that I think can be really helpful is, is doing the things where you go beyond the website, right? So look at the school's newspaper online. What are the issues they're talking about? Do those resonate with you? Look at the different clubs they have on campus. Once you go start going to information sessions, it's all going to kind of blend together. Every school is going to have over 400 activities. Every school is going to have, you know, sports teams or this or that. So that information isn't going to help you. You want to look into, okay, I really love ceramics. So does this school have a pottery studio? Can I do that in my spare time? Or I really want to study engineering. Well, there's only one engineering major at the University of Chicago. So that's molecular engineering. If you want to study any other kind of engineering, probably not the best place for you, right? Look into, you know, what other activities the school has. Like, what is the day in the life? Those are great ones that they have on the website from students. Um, a lot of schools will also, and UChicago definitely has this, is they have current undergrads who work for the admissions office, and you can email them and ask them your questions. Um, UChicago also has a really fun Tumblr page that started when I was there. Um, and that one is a little bit more um, laid back. Um, it has very cute and has a lot of like memes and stuff. So you can kind of figure out this vibe of the school as well from there. But you do have to do your research. Take notes when you're doing it. If you can visit campus, great. If not, you can do a virtual tour. There's a lot of those websites. Campus Real is one of them where you can do like just video tours of a place to get the sense of what it looks like and also look into the history. I think doing your research is important. You will, it is overwhelming, but I would say focus your search not on based on ranking, but starting with your academic interests can make it a little bit easier to, to stomach. And then if you have particular other interests, looking at what resources the school has so you can continue to do those will, will also help you write a stronger why school essay. I think that students are pretty intimidated about emailing admissions offices. I always find that students will ask us questions that are more appropriate for the admissions office. We had days when we were in charge of the e like the general email, and and it's great to be able to give students resources. But I think you know if you want something um, a little bit more current in terms of understanding what it's like to be a student, you can email the students through the admissions office um, rather than the admissions officers themselves. Uh, and sometimes you know these websites are hard to navigate. I wish that every college website had the same structure. <laughs> I just Google things. Honestly, I don't go on, on individual college websites. If I want to understand more about the environmental science major, I just Google environmental science U Chicago, and then a bunch of things come up. I am not going to go through and try and find my way on the website because <laughs> it's just impossible to do and understand for the number of schools we're looking at. I think with social media, a lot of colleges are, are doing more there and making it hopefully less intimidating for students. But 
the admissions officers are not going to blacklist you. The only case, you know, I can really think of is during the admissions process. If if you send like 30 emails to an admissions officer, they might add a note in your application and say this. I don't know, um, you know, don't overwhelm the admissions officer. If you have, you know, questions where you can't find something where you've looked for it, definitely reach out. So are there any major misconceptions that you hear about UChicago or the UChicago application process? I don't know if it's necessarily a misconception, but I think one of the biggest traps I see students apply to is like when they just want one major and they know nothing about the core curriculum. So that it's clear to me that while they only applied because of the ranking and because they read on some blog that it's a good place or they know about Booth, right? Um, and that's particularly in terms of the challenges of applying as an economics major. Other misconceptions, there used to be this understanding of UChicago as a really quirky place. That is has not been true for a while now. Um, that has <laughs> been PR, public relations out of the, any kind of messaging from the school. And I don't think it really matches the student body anymore either. So I think that's that's one thing that, that used to be a piece of it. There's a lot of like historical misconceptions. You won't graduate because it's too hard. Maybe that was true in the 80s when they had like a 30% rate of graduation. But these days, it's like 96 or 90. You know, it's very, very high. There's a lot of support for students. Their careers program has gotten so much better even since when I was there. They've, they've spent a lot of time, energy, and money on beefing up the areas that maybe were not as uh, strong before. Another one um, sometimes has to do with safety. There's, I mean, leaps and bounds of improvements just on campus in terms of lighting and, and providing those like blue light things you can you can tap if you're worried but there's so much support and there's so much um, there's so many resources to make you feel safe on campus I lived in Hyde Park for nine years after graduating so a place I call home and you know you certainly have to have a head on your shoulders um, as you would in any city but it's it's a really wonderful place that has a lot of amazing resources. And recently, so many awesome restaurants have opened up. There's just a lot more amenities that I guess you might be looking for that perhaps weren't there before. I also went to a school that had a reputation for being quote unquote, not safe. And I found that that was pretty overblown. I think mostly by parents mm -hmm. who aren't the ones actually living there. And I think it is a self-fulfilling prophecy if you go to campus and you already think it's going to be unsafe, you're going to feel unsafe all the time rather mm -hmm. than ideally students are going to come to campus and challenge those beliefs of what are safety? What are the biases I brought to my hometown that are perhaps making me feel this way? What is the reality of the situation? How can I fine tune my skills as a city dweller and always be aware, you know, not walking around with headphones in and that kind of stuff. There's always going to be petty theft on any campus, regardless of where you are terms of like other safety concerns yeah like they're they also during orientation have like common sense training because you're really smart doesn't mean you have any common sense in terms of street smart so that's definitely a good tip you know not wearing headphones when you're walking if you're walking at night don't walk alone take the bus and understand that there are those those limitations of, of any city regardless of where you are do you have any advice regarding the seasons and the winter and just yeah. how students can prepare themselves or how they can have maybe just honest expectations? Well, Chicago gets really cold. Um, it also gets really hot and humid in the summer. Definitely bring hats and scarves and gloves and closed toe shoes. I, I knew someone... <laughs> who would wear flip-flops in the winter and I never understood that he was not from here so there's some people who think that they're very tough by doing this but I wonder if he's going to have arthritis in his toes in his old age but then you know Chicago also has like they have this it's called Kuvia it's like this week of community building but they do a lot of like outdoor activities in the winter and one of them is you run into the lake in like I don't know January or something and I never did that definitely make sure you have a long coat 
you have the right blankets. But, you know, even if you come from somewhere that's warm, you will have the ability to buy all of this when you get to campus. If it gets really, really cold, like something to cover your face where you can just see your eyes. I didn't really do that. I, I was more the scarf over face person. <laughs> It'll be fine. It'll be like, if you have never seen snow, it's going to be amazing. Campus is really beautiful in all of the different seasons. Fall is definitely my favorite. I, I fell in love with you, Chicago. I came during Columbus Day to visit and that was it. I was done. I didn't want to apply anywhere else. <laughs> of course I did, but that's, that's certainly my favorite season. And yeah, watch out for ice. But they do a good job of maintaining the sidewalks. And I think the quad has like heated sidewalks. How would you say that younger students should build their profile if they're thinking of applying to U Chicago in two years, three years, four years? I don't know if lifelong learning can be taught or if it's more innate. I think that's another podcast. But think about like what you love to do. Do that. If you love photography, take photographs, make a photo book, sell it for proceeds for your favorite organization, you know, that has to do with the theme of your photographs. If you, if you want to be, you know, an investment banker, but you also like really love philosophy, read and, you know, do research on these topics. Like it's not enough to say, I love this school and I know everything about it. You also have to show impact with the activities that you're working on. The days where you could really zero in on one school and apply there and expect to get admitted are over. That's the difficulty we've come to. It's the inequity of the top schools getting the most applications, right? So my biggest advice is don't don't do your candidacy building just based on one school because you're going to be disappointed. Do your candidacy building based on what you like to do. And that is going to turn into a really strong application, right? So sure, there are things you can do to make yourself more competitive, like I'm sure a lot of other podcasts and blog posts at Ingenious talk about this, but like the types of competitions you can do or the types of things you should be pursuing if you're in a particular area. But first figure out what that area is. You want to show commitment, you want to show leadership, you want to show community building, and most importantly, you want to show impact. So first, as a young student, identify what your interests are. Second step, become an expert in those areas. Third step, this is the step that most students don't get to, is use your expertise and create an impact. That's the thing that makes students stand out. Um, and if you don't have that, someone else will win out on your spot, most likely, if you know all things are, are equal. Show how you bring that impact. And then once you get into the application writing, you can connect your impact to and your interests to majors at several different schools. Thank you so much for joining us today, Natalia. I'm sure our listeners appreciate your insight into admissions at the University of Chicago. For more information, check out our blog linked to the episode description. We even have a very special blog just focusing on the UChicago supplemental essay, so I'll link that as well. If you have any questions or would like to request a topic for a future episode, go ahead and give us a follow on social media and send us a message with the hashtag Inside Admissions. That's all for now. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next time as we continue our journey inside the admissions office.